I remember all those you know, Bugs Bunny cartoons that I used to watch when I was a kid before they were censored and some idiot decided that we were all too weak-minded as a society to watch, you know, cartoon rabbits drop anvils on cartoon ducks and car whatever and roadrunners startle coyotes off the edge of cliffs. And, uh, I remember those cartoons very fondly. They were funny as hell, and they still are if you can, if you can see the original form of them. Uh, one of the uh, recurring gags in those cartoons was how afraid elephants were of mice. You know, if somebody, if somebody saw an elephant standing there and they wanted to start a stampede, they'd, they'd put a mouse on the floor. And of course, the elephant would climb a tree trying to get away from the mouse. I don't know if that's true in real life, if elephants are really are afraid of rats or mice, but I don't know. But I used to get a kick out of that when I was a kid, how frightened elephants were in those cartoons of, of, of rodents. Something, you know, a quarter, you know, a hundredth their size. And uh, that was much the way, you know, Hilda and I related to each other. <laughs> As I said earlier, this is going to be a, a, a delicate subject because I don't want to paint anybody with a brush of, you know, 100% of blame and all those things, and it's not fair to do that. Uh, but there's, you know, there's parts of this story that are, you know, just, uh, they are what they are. So I'll try to uh just do what I can to, to tell the story and that'll be that. Everything worked out in the end. Let's just put it that way. So this was November eleventh, two thousand nine, and I was three months basically three months into my recovery from my back injury and I still wasn't really able to lay down on a flat surface without immense pain. So I was sleeping in the recliner. I was just doing everything I could. I would try, you know, after a couple of months of, of this, I was trying to, I would go into the spare bedroom downstairs and try to lay on that bed for as long as I could, you know, to see how, like, I just, I had to, I was working at it, being able to lay down, you know. Couldn't do it. So I was sleeping everywhere in the house except our marital bed, and, but then I found there was a, I had this huge, uh, fluffy leather couch in my studio, and it was saggy, so if I, I, I found if I laid on that, it would let me bend enough that I could go to sleep without being in agony, and so I started every other night trying to go up there and lay on, on that couch trying to sleep there. There always seemed to be so much animosity between, you know, directed at me from, from Hilda that I, I mean, it's, you can't really even pick out a, a spot where it was worse or better or whatever. It just was always there. But there was, there was, there was problems going on even at that time. Well, because the main reason was because 
I don't think she was playing with me anymore at that time. I think I had decided at that point that it was I was just going to go out with the boys and play what little gigs we had because we didn't have many. So that the marriage in, in, in the marriage in itself had had basically come to a head. There there was a there was some serious problems. I don't think we were speaking to each other a lot of the time. I was pissed at her because she didn't seem to care that I was hurt badly. And she was pissed at me because I was trying to make a change in the band. And I don't know. There was, it was just, it was, it was not a good scene. So, but I didn't know at the time how bad it had gotten inside her head because we weren't talking about anything, so I didn't know what was going on. I had no clue. I was just trying to survive at that point. I am whore violence. I have a very... a very negative relationship with violence. I, I grew up around it. I grew up around a woman who pulled guns and knives on people, pulled them on me, pointed guns at me, threatened me with various weapons. Uh, I had another, another older, my oldest brother, David, was incredibly violent and angry and it was as I grew up, and then I was, and then I ha I had to go through the, all of the violence that was inflicted on me in school. You know, getting beat up and pe and just and, pe and just violence, just violence for no purpose. And and in my whole life, I had witnessed violence. You know, just stupid, stupid, stupid shit. You know. People would just beat the faces off each other for no good reason. And the only thing that really ever saved me from from being from experiencing more violence was my size. People just didn't want to mess with me because I was so big that you know, they were, you know, but even then some people approached me with the purposes of trying to start a fight and I would always talk them out of it. One of the things that has kept me my entire life from ever hitting another human being, which I have never done, is my fear of killing them. I, I know how fragile the human body is, right? And, and you just, you do one thing wrong, you know, and you don't even mean to, and you're, you've just murdered somebody over nothing. You're in a bar, you're in a whatever, you're at a gig, somebody's drunk and they want to fight you or whatever, and you make one mistake and you're in prison for the rest of your life. And that's not even the fear of it. The fear of it is is accidentally hurting somebody badly. And I just never saw the point in that. I just never did. I, 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 because so much violence had been inflicted on me, I knew what it was like to be on the receiving end of it. And I just thought, my whole life, I just thought there's just no point in this. I can get by through these bad situations, you know, with the threat of violence, propensity for violence, that's contained in every human being. It's, I've heard theories over the last few years that are, I find quite correct, is that sometimes, especially between men, right, there's always a propensity for violence, even if they're in business suits, right, like there's there's this testosterone bullshit thing in our in our lizard brains, right? That's always sizing up the person that you're talking to as a as a as a combat opponent, right? And people are always, you know, posturing, and it's just it's it's actually quite fascinating how you, how the science of that works, right? 
And I've always been fascinated by that, studied psychology and studied the, these things and was, you know, took psychology in college and did, that was going to be my minor. I was fascinated by psychology and, and I've just, I just decided really early on in my life that I was not going to get drawn into that. And I never did. I either talked my way out of things or I ran. And I, I have no shame in saying that. I have no shame in saying that I've run from conflict because what would have been the point? Nobody wins in a fight. Nobody wins in a fight. Nobody wins in a war. Violence never, there's no winner in violence. Domestic violence is especially abhorrent. Because usually it's a it's it's a man beating up a woman, who he's he's bigger and stronger than, and it's done in the privacy of a marital home or a, or a shared home, away from the public eye and the and the and the victim of the violence, whether it be the man or the woman, is afraid to talk about it in public, because they don't want to look like a fool for choosing to sleep with somebody who is beating the shit out of them. So, like, that, that's, that's an even dirtier kind of violence to me, is anybody who, because it, it, I didn't know this, but domestic violence is a two-way street. There's, it's, it's, it's more done to women, but there are a large number of men who are, and it's even harder for them to, to come out and say anything about it because they're men. They're supposed to be testosterone-filled tough guys who can defend themselves. Who the hell is going to be afraid of a woman? But, you know, that's, that's, that's a misogynistic angle. Women are just as badass as men. Matter of fact, I've seen a few men get knocked out by women with one punch. Like, I mean, you can't... Uh, the sexes are, are equal sometimes in a lot of ways it's a situation that you never think you're going to be in even if it's just a one-time occurrence you don't see it coming and you and it's just it sucks it's really it really sucks and the thing that sucks the worst about it is that there's a machinery in place when something goes down between a husband and wife or common law husband and wife or whatever it might be that is virtually blind, I feel, in a very negative way. It, it, it makes a decision about the violence and then punishes one of the people. And arbitrarily, without a judge or a jury or any of these things, and sometimes that's for the best, and maybe it is for the best all the time. But what happened to Hilda in this situation could have just as well happened to me, which I found very disturbing. And I thought, you know, this is, this is not exactly the way this should go, even though you know, once I tell you the story of how this went down, you, you'll say, well, of course it should have went that way. But, you know, I was still dealing with a person that I loved. We've been together for 14 years. I, I loved her. I did, I, I, there's a lot of things I didn't like about her, and there was a lot of things she didn't like about me. But we were still there, pounding away at it, right? So on the evening, on the evening of, the, of the 10th of November, I, I went to sleep in the studio. I didn't get to sleep till well after midnight and I, I finally dozed off and it's, and I had the door closed. Uh, our master bedroom was just across the hall and about 5.30 in the morning I was a light sleeper in that place 
for, for good reason. And I heard the doorknob turning really slowly. And I immediately, my eye shot open and I looked at the doorknob and it was, it was turning. And the door came open very, very, and I didn't move. I didn't say anything. I, the door came open very, very slowly. And in walked Hilda, fully dressed. She, she was still, she was dressed for the day. And she just sort of ignored me. I don't know if she realized that I was awake or what. And she kind of quietly went across the room to the to my desk. I had this huge executive desk with my computer. All like everything about the business was there. I had organ I organized our entire lives from that desk. And she started going through the desk. And I was like, I could hear drawers being pulled open, you know, violently. And I could hear, like, I, because she was a, sort of a, a, above my head. I, and I was trying to look over the arm of the couch to see what the hell was going on over there. And so I, I finally sat up and she still didn't look at me. And she was throwing things she had she had all the papers all over the desks and she was looking at this and looking at that and pulling this out and shit was flying all over the floor and I was like I finally couldn't take it anymore and I looked I looked over and I said uh, I said what the hell are you doing and she said something like I'm not sure exactly how she worded it but she said I know you're hiding, you're stealing money from us, and I'm going to find it. I, and I said, what are you talking about? And she said, I'm going to find the money. I'm going to find it where this, all this is. We had money. We had, we had lots of debt, but we had money, and the bills were paid all the time. And I was just sitting there, and I didn't know what to do or say or anything. This this was not. This concept that she had just introduced to me was completely foreign. I'd never heard this particular theory from her before. I was just sitting there, kind of gobsmacked, going, "What is happening here?" And she got more and more agitated over at that desk. And, and I mean, that was my desk. I, that's the only place in the house that I truly owned. It was my safe space. I had a nice chair back there. It was my filing cabinets and my computer and everything. I worked from that place. I wrote songs there. I did. That was my spot, you know? And I, I just thought to myself, this is absolutely ridiculous. And she kept getting more and more agitated, more and more shit was getting thrown all over the floor. And I just, I said, okay. And I was in a bathrobe, I believe, <laughs> in a t-shirt and pajamas. And so I stood up, I walked over to her and stood there by her for a minute. And she still wasn't looking at me. She was just ripping everything apart. And I thought, well, this is insanity. So I, I got her around the shoulders and, and just, and let her out from behind the desk. And I said, you just, just go downstairs or whatever. And I couldn't even get anything out of my mouth. I had her, I was trying to just get her out the door and I, I had her by the shoulders and she, I was, I was in, I was shocked by I mean, I laugh about it now, but it wasn't funny. She was like a ninja. She tore away from me, and, and there was a microphone on a very heavy uh, boom stand in between us and the door, and it had a very expensive microphone on it. 
she ripped away from me and grabbed that mic stand. And it it we it started to be like something out of this out of Star Trek. You know, where Captain Kirk was was fighting Mr. Spock. I could almost hear the theme music in my head. I, it was just this was absolutely surreal. But I had seen her exhibit you know, pretty violent behavior with objects in her hands. And I thought, oh boy, now what the hell's going to happen? And she took a swipe at me with this mic stand it, it, at my head. And I, and I saw it coming and I, my brain was going, this isn't happening. This isn't happening. But instinctively I got my arm up and grabbed the mic stand and then grabbed the other side of it and so there we were both holding this mic stand and she was trying to get it away from me and I was terrified because she I never seen a human being that strong in my life I couldn't get it away from her I was just trying I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, okay, okay, so if I get this away from her, then what? Because I didn't know what to do. I had nowhere to go. I was backed into a corner in the room. And that's when she she started to kick me. So I caught two in the nuts. And I finally let go of this mic stand. I thought, well, she, if and I was starting to double over, and I thought, well, if she decides to kill me, here's the, here's the time to do it. And she backed up with the mic stand and just took the whole thing over her head and just smashed that microphone on the floor as hard as she could smash it. Three times. She, she put big holes in the floor. She hit the floor so hard with this poor mic that was one of the best pieces of equipment I ever owned. And then she just, I was just standing there. I had backed so far into the corner, I couldn't go any further away from her. And then she just took the whole thing and smashed it. And then she threw the whole thing on the floor and storm had this look on her face, like just pure murder. And just and started to walk out the door. And as soon as I seen her go get over the threshold, I rushed the the 12 feet or so to that door and I slammed it behind her and locked it. Now this this all sounds insane, but it's 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 it, it is insane. The, the the fact that this ever happened. I don't think that she was planning to do any of this. I think, I don't know what to think. I really don't. I don't think she even knew what the hell she was planning to do. And so I locked the door and I rushed to the phone and I called 911. Because, as I said earlier, I, I was afraid. The house was full of other weapons. There was knives and baseball bats, and I didn't know what the hell was going gonna go down. I just witnessed her. She had never well. She had laid a hand on me a few times, but not like that. That that was out of control, and I thought, well, I'm in trouble. And I was afraid. There was hatchets and axes, and meanwhile, turning away from the door. She's kicking the door, trying to get back in the room and screaming at the top of her lungs. And I'm like, okay, this is, so that's, that pushed me. It only took me about six seconds to figure out I had to call the cops. So I called 911. They answered immediately. And I, I told them what was happening. I said, my, my wife has injured me. We're ha there's something wrong. I don't even know what's going on. She came in the room. I try, I was trying to get it out and then she gets on the other line downstairs. I called the cops on a landline and she gets on the other phone downstairs and starts losing her mind to this dispatcher, which didn't look good for her, right? She, she, 
she just lost her mind. She she was she. I don't think Hilda ever did anything on purpose. She just flew into a rage, and whatever happened happened. And that's not a good way to be. And so she, she couldn't get anywhere. With the the dispatcher kept telling me, "Stay on the line, stay on the line." Are you say are you in a room? I said, "I'm in I'm in a locked room." I said, but I don't know what she's going to do. So I'm just, she, this dispatcher said, just stay there. And all, all the while, Hilda is screaming over us, trying to talk to each other. So I stayed on the phone, stayed on the phone. All of a sudden, the other line went quiet. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, now, now what? Now what the hell's going on, right? And so... All of a sudden, I hear the door slam down, the outside door slam hard, it shook the whole house. And all of a sudden, I see her car going down the driveway, just burning out. And she laid rubber at the end of the driveway, heading, to, heading for Shetty Camp. So I told the dispatcher, I said, well, she's gone. She just left, like, really fast. She, and she, she's heading towards town. So... That was that, and I'm standing there on the phone, and I'm in shock. I, I just never, like, when somebody that you that you're that you care about, you know, you're married to, like, physically attacks you. It's in, it's incredibly disturbing, and not just disturbing, but just you never think that's going to happen. You know, you get into arguments with your spouse, you know, all the time. I mean, I don't now. I mean, my my current marriage is a different world, a million miles removed from from my first marriage. But I mean, you you get it. You have disagreements and what and whatever, but you don't. You you don't take up arms against your significant other. You know, but I mean, some people do. That's what I said at the first of this video. But there's no need of it. And I remember thinking, I was sitting there, and sh the dispatcher said, we're going to send members to you immediately. Just stay locked in that room until you see the cruiser coming up the driveway. So... Because the dispatcher was asking me questions like, does she have access to firearms and stuff? And I said, yeah, her father's got all kinds of guns. And she could easily go in that house and get a gun and come back here. I said, there's, there's no, she has access to all kinds of guns. And uh, so, I, so the dispatcher was kind of uh, accelerating my panic a little bit too. She didn't mean to. She was trying to protect me, right? And so... Like I thought, I kept thinking to myself, you know, all I wanted to do was put my arm around her and say, listen, go downstairs, let me get dressed, I'll come down, we'll talk about what's wrong. That's what I was trying to do. And it instead turned into this insanity. Insanity. So I... I, I, I felt confident she wasn't coming back. Or if she did, she the cops would be there when she got there. So I went downstairs and realized how, you know, swollen one of my nuts was. And uh, I, I went to the freezer and I got a, ba a bag of corn. Ah, <laughs> uh, fuck, man. I'm telling you, it's just insanity. I get a bag of corn, and I'm holding this fro bag of frozen corn on my nutsack. And I see the cruiser coming up into the driveway, and here comes the cops, a man and a woman. Which is smart. They always have a, have a, have a you know, both sides attend a, a, dis a domestic dispute. I think that's smart of the Maoris to do that. And they, they, I opened the door and they took one look at me. I'm standing there literally holding a bag of corn on my bag, on my own bag. And they're, they're, how, how you doing, Mr. Cormier? What's going on? I said, I, I said, I don't know. Uh, 
and I just walked away from them. I was in shock. I still had no idea. Like, I didn't know where the hell any of this was going. I was like, what's going to happen? Like, how does hell does all this work? And how bad was it really? And should we... I guess didn't know what to do. And I walked away from the cops and went into the living room and sat in my recliner and had this bag of corn. And they followed me in there, and they're just quiet. They're just looking at me. And uh, the woman, the female member, said, you don't look so good. I said, well, probably not. And uh, she said, did she did she hit you? I said, yeah, she kicked me twice in the balls. And I literally just took the corn off, showed her my nuts. You know, one of my balls was the size of a baseball. And so I... I was just sitting there, and they're like, well, um, where did she go? I said, well, she headed towards town. I said, you probably passed her on the way. And they said, well, what kind of a car? And I said, told her the car. And they said, you just stay here. Don't leave the house. Keep the doors locked. We're going to go to town and find her. So they took off with their lights on and and. And all this while, all the while this is going on, I'm still, I'm actually terrified for her now. I'm thinking, what, what has just happened? Like how, why, what's, should I have called the cops? Should I, I was, I didn't know what to do. I was in a blind panic about everything. So it wasn't 20 minutes later, 25, maybe a half an hour later. The RCMP called me, and I said, uh, "I said they said, are you are you okay?" I said, "Yeah, I'm 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 gonna be okay." They said, "Well, your wife is in custody here at the jail," and I said, "What?" Because that's not what I expected to happen at all. I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, we found her at the ER." Uh, making a complaint against you to a doctor there, and I would have known the doctor. There was only two doctors in the whole town, and everybody knew them well. Like close, the 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 doctor she likely talked to was friends, a friend of ours, right? And she, they, the cop says she she was at the ER in in the examination room with a doctor making a complaint against you that you her exact words had beat the shit out of her. <laughs> so the doctor examined her, took all her, took her top off and took everything, looked her all over everywhere. Couldn't find a mark on her. So the doctor went outside the room, looked at the Mounties and said, there's, there's no evidence whatsoever that this woman has ever been assaulted. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what you want to do. But she she was very agitated. And so the cops arrested her. Uh, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's what they told me. So, I, so they took her to the station. And here was the part that I just didn't see coming. And I... Initially, he thought to myself, like, this just isn't very fair to her. Uh, they, they charged her with assault and battery, domestic violence, and, and, and put a restraining order on her without even telling me that was it. Her, she was restrained from coming back to the house, from coming anywhere near me, indefinitely. It just, it wasn't going to end until it was either heard in court or even after court, it could still be in place. Like, it was just, I thought, holy shit, like, what is going on here? How, why? So that became a problem for me. I was like, this is not good. You know, because I was still of the mind, how the hell are we supposed to work this out if she can't even come where I am? 
and I was still all the things that you go through, right? When 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 something like this happens, it's not good. It's not good for anybody, and so they just they they said just. Uh, I don't know. We don't know where we're, we've, we're releasing her in a few minutes, taking her back to her car. And if you see her, you've got to call right away. You're going to have to keep a lookout for the next 48 hours is, is the, usually the time when people uh, disregard these restraining orders. So just keep your eyes open. If you see her at all, you call us and she'll be arrested again and put in jail. So I hung up and then I just sat there for days hoping she wouldn't come there because I didn't want to see her go to jail. That was not the point of anything. And so I was just sitting there. I sat there for days. And I, to be quite honest with you, I was just inconsolable. I, I was, I, I just, I, my marriage ended in the space of about 35 minutes. That was it. It's all it took. It was going to, it was a slow death from that point on, but it, it was over. I knew it was over and I, but there was a part of me was trying to salvage it, but I didn't know how to do that because the law was involved and there and it was a, it was these guys weren't fucking around it, this was serious shit and so on the second or third day i had never heard from her she never called me she nobody i didn't know where she was uh the the marriage counselor that we had gone to see in Inverness called me and I he said I heard I heard that there was some problems down there with you two and I said I said and I mean, how the hell does anybody know this shit that's how fast news travels in Cape Breton in Cape Breton it's just like there's no reason for him 30 miles away to know what happened in my house at 5 30 in the morning three days before but he knew so I, I said, yeah, there was, we had a, we had an altercation. It was pretty serious and the cops got involved and she's told him the whole story. And he said, he said, well, it's a good thing it turned out that way. And I said, why? He said, because, you know, your wife, your wife has needs, needs to seek counseling as does, as do most people. And, uh, but she, like he told me, which I'm not going to talk about, but he told me what his diagnosis of her was. And that he said, he said, I wasn't allowed to tell you this because you're both in, you're both my clients. I'm not allowed to single out one of the people and say, you, you, you have this and you need to do this to fix it. He said, but, but she, she needs, she needs treatment. She needs counseling and possibly medication. As you said, it's, it's a common, it's a common thing he said but it's it's very dangerous you know pe people get killed you know in these situations because because there's an untreated mental illness and as i've said before and i'll say it again uh hilda's a byproduct of her childhood and it was not pleasant as mine was not and i probably have just as many problems as she did and they were not compatible. <laughs> it's like that Castleman song. I can't find anybody as crazy as me. Like that's it's that's the that's the honest to God truth. It's she had no major malfunction, but her malfunction didn't go along with mine at all. And so. Uh, I just, I, all, I just sort of, I, I just, I don't know what I did. I don't remember even what the hell I was doing. It wasn't too much longer, I guess, after, after everything went down. Uh, 
I don't remember if I talked to her parents. Um, they weren't upset with me at all. Uh, I know I remember that much. Uh, but she ended up in Sydney at what I assume is, is a home for battered women. Which didn't make any sense to me. I mean, so she's the one charged with assault, waiting to go to court, and has a restraining order on her, but yet they take her in at this place. And, I mean, she had nowhere else to go. She, and this place offered counseling. So I thought, okay, this, you know, this might be good. Might, maybe, so, you know, I thought maybe this is what ha needs to happen. So she, as far as I could, was being told she was there and she was well and she was working in, in, the, in the place. She was very fastidious, clean, neat person. Uh, I'm not probably one of the reasons she tried to kill me and uh, no she didn't try to kill me but anyhow that's a joke but anyhow she <laughs> uh, I, she, I mean it seemed okay so I think somewhere in between there and mid-December there was actually a phone call which wasn't allowed in the restraining order, but I wanted to talk to her. You know, I wanted, to, I, I was still of the mind that maybe this would be the catalyst where we could, you know, completely clear the air. Maybe she could go get counseling and treatment and I could go get counseling and treatment and we could do it separately and come back into the relationship on more solid footing. But you have to want, if you have a problem, right? If you have a mental illness or a, anything like that, PTSD or doesn't matter what it is, if you don't really want treatment, you're, there's no army of psychiatrists or psychologists or counselors that can ever help you. Because if you're not gonna, if you're not going to address all the the problem head on, you're never gonna get any results. And so, the first phone call I had with her was horrible. It started out okay, but it deteriorated into the same old thing. Her basically calling me down to the lowest for everything that had ever happened in 14 years. And all a, a lot, 95% of it was just completely pointless, incidental, not even important to the big picture bullshit. And, she, and, she, and I could see she was just not letting go of any of this stuff. And I just said, okay, fine. Just do whatever you have to do. And I hung up. Never forget that Christmas. Hilda wasn't much for Christmas. Uh, I mean, I remember one Christmas, all she got me was a pizza pan. You know what I mean? It was that. It was that kind of how she didn't like. She hated receiving gifts. Didn't really celebrate like to celebrate Christmas at all. And I was the opposite, the furthest end of the spectrum. I lived for Christmas, and so I remember being. I was just floating around that house from the 11th of November until about the 20th of December. And I said, well, fuck this. I'm going to have a Christmas. And I, I got a tree. I put the tree up. I watched all the, you know, the requisite uh, CBC Christmas programming. You know, watched the Grinch. And I watched, you know what I mean? And I floated around this house with this tree sitting there with nothing underneath it. And I said, well, fuck this. And I, I remember going, I was out somewhere doing something at, at some point in Sydney or Halifax or somewhere, and I saw a nice watch in, in this jewelry store. 
that cost about, I don't know how much it cost. It was about a thousand dollar watch. And, uh, I said, fuck this. I'm going to, I'm, that's my Christmas present. So I bought, I bought myself this, this thousand dollar citizen watch and had them wrap it. And I went home and I put the little box under the tree with my name on the box. It was, it was pathetic. It really was. It was just pathetic. I, I get up on Christmas morning. I'll never forget it. I get up on Christmas morning and I used to love to go places on Christmas Eve and visit people and play music. And that's what we, I did there every year, even though she didn't want to do it, I would end up having to go out by myself and I'd make my rounds and I'd go see my buddies like Jalos and, and Renee and Doreen and Morris and like anybody I thought, you know, let's, I'll drop in here, have a tune, have a beer, whatever. Uh, and she never wanted to do any of those things. So I got up on Christmas morning and I'm sitting there in the recliner in my bathrobe and it's quiet and there's not a sound and it's cold and snowy outside and I'm look, I'm just looking at that tree and that stupid box under the tree, little tiny box. And I'm thinking, this is not what I intended my life to be. This is, this is pathetic. I'm sitting here. I got no family around me. I can't see my brothers. My mother and father are both dead. My, I don't have anybody. I'm just, she's gone. Where the hell she is? She was my family and now she's gone. And I'm just sitting here looking at this stupid fucking box under this tree that I bought for myself. And so I opened the box, put the watch on, said Merry Christmas to me. And I think, I think at that point I went out, I went out and started visit. I went out and visit some people. Um, but that was sort of my life uh, right up until March. I think there were some gigs potentially during this time. I don't really remember. I was so out of it that I wasn't really sure, you know, what, what was going on. And there were a couple, there were some more phone calls that went badly. And... I just was a zombie from November till sometime in March. Right before March, I, 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 I made some call. Now, the other thing that happened too, I got to say this. It wasn't too much. It was, it was less. It was a couple of three, three weeks after this all happened that I actually went to the Mounties and said, uh, you know, how how do I get this restraining order lifted? Because this is ridiculous. This is by the, by this time I had found out where she was and I was like, uh, what the hell? And so I, I went to the cops and I said, how do I get this restraining order lifted? And he said, they said, well, you're going to have to go to the court and apply to have it lifted. And the Mountie said, but don't do it. And I said, why? He said, it actually was the it was the woman that attended us. It was it was the female Mountie, the member, and she said, "Don't do it." I said, "Why?" And she said, "Because that's how horrible things happen, and things get worse." She said, "If you you know if you if you're trying if you want to reconcile, let this take its process through the legal system." And work on reconciling while it's going through. If you if you just let her come back, and we and you and you go to the court and petition to drop these charges, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. She might need this time to reflect on on what you know where. And she was very. I was amazed at how she counseled me. And. She talked me out of doing it. She taught, I was going to do it, but she talked me out of it. And so all of this was in play for this, this time period. And it wasn't too much long after that, that 
I was in the co-op one day, and I happened to look at the, you know, the rack where the Inquirer and all that shit was there, and Frank Magazine was there, and who's on the front fucking cover? Me and Hilda. On the front cover of Frank, that was, was we were the picture, and I, I was, I was, well, I wasn't mortified. In a way, I, I knew that most people knew that our relationship was kind of volatile, so I wasn't surprised to see this on there, and I was like, I bought the magazine, I took it home, read the article, which was just, most of it was absolutely bullshit, and, but they knew everything, they had talked to the police, they had talked to everybody, and I don't know whether Hilda ever saw that magazine or what, but probably she did, I don't know. And, uh, but at, it was at that point, too, that I kind of looked at the situation and went, this is just out of control, out of control. Like, this is, I'm a very private person, and, and, that, and that's, that sounds idiotic after describing my entire life for 69 weeks. But I have always been, prior to this, incredibly closed-lipped about my life to a certain extent. I've written a lot about my life and my music, but sometimes never attributed attributed it to my own existence. So I looked at that magazine and just thought, holy shit, man, this is just, this is this no good. Like this, it's getting, it's going from bad to worse, you know? So to, to, to close this chapter, uh, the way that this basically ended was time. Time went by. She she received a lot of counseling, and I had time to think and figure out what the hell I was, you know, what what I contributed to the problem, which was, I think, an equal share. And uh, I just think she over overreacted to it, which people do, right? So, and. At some point in March, we had a phone call, and she had already gone to court and pled non guilty, not not guilty, of course. Had a, got a lawyer and was scheduled to go on trial for it. It was going to be a trial, and so in March, at some point, I we had a phone call, and she. She genuinely seemed to have changed. Something had changed. And she was talking differently and just... We had a long, long conversation about everything. And I, I thought, Jesus, maybe maybe this worked. You know, maybe, maybe we've both had, uh, you know... What four months or whatever it was to 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 work on ourselves apart, and she's had some help. She's from counseling, and there's people there talking, helping her. And I had my friends talking to me, and I had like I mean, it was. And I thought, okay, maybe, maybe, this is it. Maybe, maybe we could actually pull this off. And so. I started to make arrangements to to do what the police told me not to do and get these the, get the charges dropped and get the restraining order lifted which was a massive project it was not fun I had to deal with the court I had to deal with the police I had to I don't even I don't even remember but it was a big process and and it took a while and finally I I I was able to get everything dropped and she headed home and so it was sad it was it was sad part part of her it was obvious that part of her uh you know really regretted not only what happened that that caused all of this but 
regretted, you know, the the marriage, all the shit that we went that we did to each other that was ridiculous, and and just said, you know, not not, not as much did, but said, you know, her picking on me and me being an arsehole in def, in self defense. You just say shit to people as fucking poison, right? And she, so she showed, I never forget it. She showed up to the door. This woman only weighed 99 pounds on a good day. And she was, uh, she, she walked up those steps to the door when she arrived at home. And she was skeletal. She had lost, I don't know how much weight, but she couldn't have weighed more than 80 pounds. She was just, her clothes were just hanging off of her. And I thought, holy shit. I just, I just felt horrible. I just, it was just, it was horrible. And so we, she came in the house and, and we, and we sat down and talked for a long time and things looked really good, really good. And it, it lasted for two weeks. That was it. After the second week, I don't know if, if I was just incapable, uh, like she just, uh, I don't know what I was doing. I wasn't, I didn't think I had done anything wrong, but after two weeks time, she just reverted back to the old Hilda. And I, it was like a light switch. And I, and I, at that point in time, I started to, to plan my escape. Because I knew I couldn't stay there. Uh, and after two weeks time, I was again sleeping in other rooms in the house. Uh, we spent two weeks in our, in, in our, in our bedroom but then after after she went back to the dark side i i didn't trust her anymore and i didn't i and it's not just her i've had a few people come aboard of me either strike me or threaten to or and after they all through my life when those people did that i never trusted them again ever it was just not in me to ever trust somebody who was either displayed violence or threatened violence. To me, I just never, ever trusted them again. And unfortunately, she fell into that category, and so there was just no way, and I wasn't going to see her put out of the house again. That was the other thing that came into play, is that as bad as all of this shit was, I think what happened to her because of all of it was... Horrible. Bullshit. It sh There's got to be a better way to handle that problem than that. But that's the nature of the law and the nature of whatever. And I just thought, I have no choice but to get the fuck out of here and never come back. And she can stay here because she doesn't have anywhere to go. She doesn't have a job without me. And... <sighs> So that was the decision. And uh, the guys and I were out playing without her. And she eventually went and got a job as a chambermaid at one of the local hotels that was very, very busy. And an excellent. She's an excellent person for that. She was so well organized and and clean, very French Acadian clean woman, right? Like she knew how to clean, she knew how to organize, she knew how she was exceptional at that job, and she'd had that type of job before. And so she took a job, uh, you know, taking care of this huge motel. And so she was, she was uh, out working during the day, you know? And I was out playing with the guys, staggering around with a cane, and and uh, we were getting some gigs, and I get and I got some money ahead. Get, and I guess I might as well finish with this. 
I went to a party uh, on the, uh, I think it was the 10th of May of 2010. I went to a party and in Canso with my buddy Jim Hanlon, and we ended up, we, we played some kind of a show there, and then we ended up staying in the ass end of this pharmacy. And during that day, I looked at Jim and I said, I said, I, gotta, I have to leave my house. And Jim said, of course you do. I was still always surprised when people, when I showed signs of getting out of that marriage, when people were like, yeah, why wouldn't you? And it, it, it partly offended me for Hilda and partly offended me for me that I, that I was, they thought I was stupid, right, for staying. And I said, well, I don't know where to go. He said, well, come here, move to Canso. And uh, I said, How, well, well, where the hell am I going to go? And it wasn't long before there was sort of a plan made. And I said, okay, well, I guess, I guess, I gotta, I guess I'm going to do it then because I, I didn't know how I was going to do it. But it wasn't too long after that, a couple of weeks later, uh, while Hilda was at work, I called my buddy, Morris, said, come into the house, I'm leaving here, I need you to help me get all my shit out. I packed everything I owned into garbage bags and every instrument I had and as much shit as I could possibly carry, as I could possibly load into a minivan. I put all my instruments in Morris's truck. I said, you take these to your house and hide them. And he did. And I, I took a few instruments with me that I needed to play, to work. And I, and I took every single thing that I owned out of that house in garbage bags and loaded the truck, loaded the uh, minivan to the ceiling. And as we were finishing the last load to Morris's truck, <laughs> Hilda showed up, home early from work. And she just walked up and said... What is what's going on? I said I'm leaving, and she was devastated. She's like, "Well, why?" And I said, "Because I am. I'm leaving. I'm sorry. I'm gone. I'm gone." And she just didn't seem to understand why I was leaving, and I and it, it was painful. It was painful to watch her confusion as to why I was leaving, and so. I had Kermit, my little dog I brought from Nashville with, with me, and I, I said, Kermit, you want to stay with Mom or you want to stay with me? I was standing in the driveway, and I, I considered I, I would have let her keep the dog because she she's going to be there all alone. But I, as soon as I said it, the do <laughs> this was said. It's funny now, but it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny to her, I'm sure. It was, as soon as I said that, the dog just like lightning ran for the van, jumped inside the van. And I said, and, she, and Hilda kind of followed me to the car. And I, and I said, uh, she said, well, where are you going? I said, I don't know yet, but uh, I'm going away from here. And uh, I said, you'll be okay. Just stay here. You're fine. I'll keep the point. I'll keep the mortgage up. And I, and I just, I left. And I remember looking in the rear view mirror, uh, well, the side mirror, because the van was loaded right to the ceiling, and her just standing in the middle of the driveway at the top of the hill with this conf absolutely confused look on her face. And Morris behind me with a truck full of instruments, he pissed off down to Shetty Camp, hit all my shit, and I took off for Canso. And that was the end of an era. An era. Like, it was... The, the the positive effects of my marriage to her were profound on my career, but also they were as equally damaging. It, there was a, there was it was such a volatile relationship that it sort of it sort of canceled itself out. All of the headway we I made in the industry was canceled out by 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 us not just not being able to get along and not getting along in public and 
it was it was it was equally good and bad to the point where when I left there she just went back to her normal life which is fine like she she's a resor- she was a resourceful person easily employed she was a very good employee like to a job right not so much in a band it was a different dynamic but you know she quickly got jobs and did her thing and and was frugal and never was wanting for money and and I went on and just basically started my career from scratch that's exactly what I had to do because all the progress I'd made up to that point had been erased by the the bullshit of my personal life right and I and so I started again at the age of 41 uh there I was again alone except for the guys the Elliot brothers were with me we were still touring that was going fantastic but I was starting again I was starting again and was building a whole new thing which felt fantastic in a lot of ways and in other ways it was terrifying but you know when I look back on it now and realize that I'm you know 12 years away removed from all of this almost as long as I was married to her I'm away from it it was the best decision for everybody involved it was and some and you know there was probably times during the the months after I left there that 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 either one of us thought maybe this wasn't such a great idea but it was it was the best thing for both of us and it's it's horrible that it ended the way it did but that's the way life goes people are people they have their reasonings behind doing everything that they do and those reasons are incredibly real to them even if they're not real to the rest of the world or to their significant other, everybody has their own motivations and, they're, and they belong to themselves. There's, everyone must live inside their own head. And sometimes two heads aren't better than one.